Lymphoma is a type of blood cancer. It's a cancer of a white blood cell called the lymphocyte. And there's over or approximately 100 different subtypes of lymphoma, which makes me feel really lucky to be able to just focus on lymphomas in my practice. The main divide is Hodgkin and non-Hodgkin. One's not better than the other, they're just different. About 10% of cases are Hodgkin and 90% are non-Hodgkin. So the vast majority of patients have non-Hodgkin lymphoma. But within Hodgkin, um, there's only two different subtypes. So it can be classical Hodgkin lymphoma or something called nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma, which actually behaves kind of like a non-Hodgkin lymphoma. So really when we're talking about Hodgkin lymphoma, we're referring to the classical Hodgkin lymphoma, which has several different type subtypes. So all of these names can sound similar and be quite confusing um, to a patient who may or may not have any you know, background in, in medicine. So I always spend time when meeting someone going through the type of lymphoma they have and Hodgkin versus non-Hodgkin. Uh, the most common question is, is, which is the better one? Is that the good one? Um, and overall prognosis in lymphomas is, is typically good compared to many other types of cancers. And the treatments are different, the workup's different. Um, so that's why it's important to understand the difference between Hodgkin and non-Hodgkin lymphomas. Non-Hodgkin lymphoma can be a cancer of either a T lymphocyte or a B lymphocyte. And there's many different subtypes among those. They can be aggressive, they can be indolent. Hodgkin lymphoma is technically a B cell that is cancerous, but it's lost its normal markers or flags on the outside of the cells that make it look like a usual B cell. And it has gained other flags or markers on the outside of the cells. One of them in classical Hodgkin lymphoma is called CD30, which is really important diagnostically and therapeutically because we have some targets for those proteins that are you know, being ex expressed on that type of lymphoma. The challenging thing about diagnosing Hodgkin lymphoma is that it's really characterized by a inflammatory background. So the majority of that lymph node mass or tumor you might be seeing on a scan or a patient may, might feel, is this just inflammatory network called the microenvironment that has cells and proteins and things that feed the very few cancerous cells that are in that lymph node mass. Those cancerous cells in Hodgkin lymphoma are called Reed-Sternberg cells, and they have a very characteristic appearance. Um, and the few Reed-Sternberg cells in a very inflammatory background is really what gives us the diagnosis of classical Hodgkin lymphoma and has helped us figure out a lot about how we treat Hodgkin lymphoma as this treatment landscape has evolved pretty rapidly over the past 10 years or so. So typically patients present with symptoms, uh, maybe feeling a lymph node, uh, you know, a mass, an enlargement, maybe they could see somewhere in their neck. Other patients might have something called B symptoms, which is drenching night sweats, um, unintentional weight loss. So you're losing 10% of your body weight and really can't explain it by your activities or any diet changes. Itching is something that can commonly be a symptom of patients with Hodgkin lymphoma. And um, fatigue, unexplained fatigue is another symptom that may happen. And when we have night sweats, these night sweats are really drenching, like patients drench their pajamas, drench their sheets, have to change clothes a few times a night, not just a mild feeling warm. Uh, many patients though may be completely asymptomatic. Say a patient had a cough or an unrelated symptom, went to their primary care doctor and was found to have a lymph node. Um, cough can be a, a presentation of Hodgkin lymphoma, particularly if a patient has their lymphoma in the chest. Um, sometimes patients will present with a cough and get a chest x-ray and the lymphoma is found that way. Um, so typically clinical suspicion um, or imaging that incidentally reveals a lymph node or a mass is the initial presentation of classical Hodgkin lymphoma. It can happen to patients at any age. Um, there's two more common peaks happening to patients in the late teens, early 20s, and then somewhere around in their 60s or so is the second peak. But certainly I have many patients in their 40s or 50s that have Hodgkin lymphoma. And the diagnosis, it's really important to get a good tissue sample. So there's various different ways to do a biopsy, but without a biopsy, you really can't make a diagnosis of a classical Hodgkin lymphoma. Different or lymphoma in general. 
Um, different types of biopsies include something called an FNA or fine needle aspiration. That's where a needle is placed in the abnormal area and a few of the cells are suctioned out in a liquid and, and examined under the microscope. That's really inadequate for any diagnosis of lymphoma, whether it's Hodgkin or non-Hodgkin, because it's really important to see how the abnormal cells are arranged within the lymph node, what that architecture is to give us that subtype of, of lymphoma um, that we can see. And with Hodgkin lymphoma, you know, there's this big inflammatory background with only a few malignant cells. So you really need a good sample, which is at least something called a core needle biopsy, where a needle is placed into the abnormal area um, with a hollow center, and then a small piece of the lymph node is removed or an actual surgical biopsy where you take out the entire lymph node or a piece of the mass. And then that's examined under the microscope. Um, special staining is done to see what those markers, those proteins or flags on the outside of the lymphoma are. And that helps us subtype what type of lymphoma it is and makes the diagnosis of classical Hodgkin lymphoma. So the treatment landscape of classical Hodgkin lymphoma is really changing dramatically in a wonderful and hopeful way for patients. The mainstay of treatment in the frontline setting remains chemotherapy based. And there's various different factors of a patient's case that help us decide which chemotherapy to use, how long the chemotherapy treatment can be, and whether or not we use things like radiation therapy after the chemotherapy um, to give the patients the best chance of cure. Um, intent for treatment with Hodgkin lymphoma is cure. It's a, you know, a curable disease. And so we're always looking at whatever treatment will give the patient the best chance of getting ready their, rid of their disease forever while minimizing the chance of long-term side effects. So since Hodgkin lymphoma in general has a very high cure rate compared to many other cancers and can affect young patients, we really have shifted a lot in the last five to 10 years um, away from giving the more toxic therapies that have a higher potential for long-term side effects like secondary cancers or infertility and have tried to minimize the number of cycles of chemotherapy um, by individualizing the approach based on the stage, whether or not the patient has B symptoms or any other high-risk features um, and comorbid conditions, any other medical conditions. And that's how we decide which program to use for patients with Hodgkin lymphoma. So the previous standard of care used to be an intensive chemotherapy called escalated Biacop for many patients. And then came along this more recent chemotherapy cocktail called ABVD, which is a combination of four different chemotherapies given once every two weeks. More recently, um, for patients with certain types of classical Hodgkin lymphoma, for example, advanced stage disease, stage three or four, we further adjusted the ABVD regimen to include a targeted chemotherapy that targets that CD30 flag on the outside of Hodgkin lymphoma and has helped improved outcomes. And that regimen is called AAVD. And patients that have early stage disease, you know, they typically get the chemotherapy ABVD um, for a shorter period, maybe with radiation. Um, for patients that have advanced stage disease, either of those two chemotherapy cocktails would be an option. Um, and other things are taken into consideration, like whether or not the patient has peripheral neuropathy at baseline. Um, bleomycin is a medication we use with ABVD, but not a AVD, and that can affect the lungs. So anybody who has current or past smoking, we typically don't use that regimen. So really not only are the different chemo regimens personalized to the patient's disease, but also the patient's life. Um, what other issues do they have? What um, symptoms do they have? And that helps us pick the best treatment to hopefully cure the disease and again, minimize those side effects. So the standard of care for relapse refractory classical Hodgkin lymphoma depends on what happened in the frontline setting. So we wanna know, did the patient go into a complete response and then relapse a year later, four years later? Um, those are, are considered differently. Or did the patient never achieve a remission to their frontline therapy? There is a small percentage of patients, maybe around 10% that are refractory to their first line therapy for classical Hodgkin lymphoma. 
Typically, the standard of care had been to do some sort of salvage therapy, which can be chemotherapy, a different chemotherapy in certain situations, or using some of these more novel medications like the immune therapy or the antibody drug conjugate, sneak attack therapy, I'll call it, um, targeted therapies. And you get those to, until a patient goes into remission. And then once they're in a remission, we consider doing a bone marrow or a stem cell transplantation. It's an autologous stem cell transplantation, meaning using the patient's own immune system, which is different than the allogeneic stem cell transplant, which is when you find a match and use someone else's immune system. So with that first relapse, you consider some sort of therapy, which is selected based on your initial course Consider a stem cell transplantation with curative intent, again, still curable in the relapse setting. And then depending on the risk factors of how the patient relapsed and what the symptoms are at relapse, we consider some further treatment after the transplant called consolidation to help further reduce the chance of an additional relapse. If an additional relapse does occur at that time point, then we do sometimes consider the other type of transplant and we certainly could consider the immune therapy or the targeted therapies if they haven't been used already and clinical trials are very active in this space as well as the upfront and first relapse space so it's always important to talk about clinical trial options with your provider as that may be an excellent choice for patients with Hodgkin lymphoma.